Hello, and welcome to the World Massage Conference. I'm Melanie Hayden, and I will be your host for Cupping, Who, What, When, Where, and Why, with our special instructor, Paul Kohlmeyer. If you are joining us for the live class, remember to jump into the chat room located just to the right of the broadcast screen there. Take advantage of the opportunity to ask Paul questions during this live event and share your feedback with the other therapists from around the globe. Just before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Thank you to our global sponsor, Massage Envy. Massage Envy is a community of caregivers committed to helping people feel their best. They believe that therapeutic massage and customized skin care are an integral part of the well-being journey. If you share this belief, they'd like to get to know you better. Learn more at massageenvy.com forward slash careers. And thank you so much to our education partner. Associated Bodywork and Massage Professionals provides an extensive array of member benefits and exceptional liability insurance. Visit abmp.com to discover why over 80,000 massage and bodywork professionals have chosen ABMP as their professional association. And thank you to our daily sponsors, Massage and Bodywork Magazine, Bon Vital, BioFreeze, and Massage Warehouse. Cupping, who, what, when, where, and why. This introductory presentation is designed for manual therapists who are curious about cupping therapy and wondering if they should incorporate it into their clinical environment or for those who may only be interested in gaining a better understanding of the technique. In addition to answering the five W's, you'll see video demonstrations of cupping techniques. I'd like to introduce our instructor. Paul Komar is a registered massage therapist and registered acupuncturist who is also trained as a traditional Chinese medicine herbalist. Graduating with a physical education degree from the University of Manitoba, Paul went on to obtain his diploma in massage therapy from Wellington College and diploma in both acupuncture and Chinese medicine. Paul takes a decidedly different approach, focusing on current thinking and science, as well as adding a feedback-based model of explanation that includes a patient-directed approach. We're really excited to have Paul on the World Massage Conference today because, as we know, uh, cupping has become really popular. So, Paul, we're looking forward to your presentation, and welcome to the World Massage Conference. Thank you so much for the welcome, and thank you for being part of this conference. It's really important that uh, we have these venues that we can get together, maybe not physically, but come together and uh, share ideas and discuss important things. So, mm, thank you absolutely. again for this. Yeah. So, um, let's get right into it because I know we're always got, we want to be on time. So cupping, who, what, when, where, and why? And I'll probably add a little bit of how in there just for good measure. So um, I always like to start with this picture because I think it's quite beautiful. Um, it shows a lot of things going on um, in, in our world. Uh, if you look into the background, you can see there are plastic bottles and things on a picnic table. So this is a current picture, and it's a, a picture also using very, very old techniques of cupping where they're using an animal horn that's been hollowed out uh, to uh, create the vessel with which we cup. Uh, so I think it's really interesting to see this history. Um, the history of cupping, uh, it's really old. Um, people always say, well, you know, what they think uh, of it in terms of the, the Chinese medicine. But in fact, we see it much earlier uh, from uh, papyrus in Egypt. Um, then it kind of spread into Greece, where we see the next instance of it written. And then we find it written about in China. And then it moved throughout the world, usually along trade routes. Uh, as you saw from the picture previous, this is something that people can practice on each other with as long as they have the vessels uh, to do cupping. So it could travel with sailors, it could travel with uh, spice merchants, it can travel with families. Uh, so it, it spread around the world slowly from there. Um, types of cups, again, in that picture, you saw antlers uh, uh, being used or horns being used. Um, there are bamboo cups that we see. Uh, I've got a sample of those. Uh, they're quite interesting, uh, laminated with uh, some shellac or something to keep them airtight. 
Um, more often we see them as glass or porcelain. Historically, they were, would have been metal as well, iron, brass, or bronze, but we don't really see that anymore. Glass is what's most common uh, as, a, as a medium because it's really easy to produce. We're seeing a resurgence in porcelain lately, uh, but I don't like it so much because you can't see through it really well. And then you have silicone and plastic and rubber cups that are, I guess, the most current uh, as, as our technology in materials comes along. These other newer kinds of materials are used right in with the cups, and they're quite fun to use. They're easy to take care of. If you drop them on the floor, they don't break like glass can. They don't crack like bamboo does, So, and certainly they don't burn like bamboo does. So they're, the newer materials are quite good to use. And we see many, many different cupping techniques being used. Uh, this is not an, a whole list. This is some of the types of cuppings you'll see. There are many different people trying to categorize cupping, and these are some of the most common. So when we think of cupping um, in the traditional Chinese medical sense, we think of it as uh, there's no lubrication put on, the cup is just put on, placed on the body, and then left there. It's not moved around at all. So it's usually referred to as dry cupping in that there's no lubrication, the, so the cup doesn't slide on the skin very well by itself, no matter what material it's made of. So dry cupping is just that, with no lubrication. Um, a little further down the list, you see it's called static cupping. Kind of synonymous, but not exactly the same. The opposite of dry cupping in semantics, we say is wet cupping, but wet cupping is a whole different ball game. Uh, you'll see this in um, Middle Eastern medicine or Chinese medicine as bloodletting with cups. Of course, this is out of scope of practice for massage therapists, so we don't want to see anybody doing this the therapist or the practitioner of wet cupping will cut the skin either with a small lancet or a small, um, actually looks like a small knife uh, in the Persian and uh, Middle Eastern medicines. And uh, then they'll use the cups to literally pull out some blood. Um, so you'll get blood in the cups. And I think it's important to, to at least talk about wet cupping, even if we don't do it, because if you type in cupping into a Google search, you're going to see, your patients are going to see uh, pictures of cups full of blood. And so you have to be able to at least talk about it uh, and have some idea of what it looks like and really to say, yeah, that's out of the scope of practice for us. We aren't going to be doing that. The next style of cupping that we often see, this is more of the Chinese style uh, where you use an open flame to heat the air inside the cup uh, and then put the cup on the body without the flame in it. And that instantly or almost instantly cools the cup, cools the air in the cup because the cup itself hasn't been warmed up. Uh, that causes contraction of the air, which creates the vacuum once the seal is in place of the mouth of the cup on the patient's skin. Um, for some massage therapists, they're allowed to do it. For some it's out of scope of practice uh, because uh, their professional liability insurance won't cover you or the building that you're working in uh, doesn't have, doesn't allow you to have open flames. So with fire cupping, uh, while it's very nice looking and it looks very exotic, we tend to steer people away from it uh, for massage therapists use anyway. Static cupping, we've already gone over. It's quite like dry cupping. So the opposite of static cupping is dynamic cupping. And this is usually done with some lubrication, uh, some massage oil uh, I use a lot. So massage therapists are in a prime position to do this so, and to add it into our practice because you can add it in right in the middle of your uh, massage treatment if you have the indication. So you'd put the cup on, whether it's silicone or or a vacuum cup, or if you can, uh, are able to, you can use a fire cup, but I would generally stay with both silicone or vacuum styles of cupping. 
And you can put that up, uh, that on the body, and then slide it around uh, over the area that you want to treat. Uh, it's really quite an interesting um, way of working with the cups. I do it daily. It's quite amazing, and patients love it. So that's what we'll be, as a massage therapist, the dynamic cupping is mostly what you'll um, focus on. Light, medium, and strong cupping are just talking more about the strength of the cupping, how much vacuum do you have uh, within the cup? So light being just a little pressure, medium being fairly heavy, kind of in the middle, and strong cupping is where you take a lot of air out of the cup and create a very strong vacuum. Um, generally for static cupping, you tend to do um, more strong treatments and with dynamic cupping you tend towards more light to medium treatments mostly because it's easier to move a cup against the skin and it's more comfortable for the patient to use it on the skin uh, if the pressure isn't so high. Pulsatile cupping uh, is one that we don't see very often in Canada though we see it a lot in the States and this is the use of a usually a vacuum style cup um, and it's attached by a hose to a machine that has an air pump in it. And what the, the machine does is it varies the amount of suction uh, or the pressure of the suction within the cup. So over the course of time, if the cup is on, it'll increase and decrease the pressure. And that's thought to um, change the dynamics of how the cup is affecting the body. I haven't seen a lot of science on this one, so I don't talk about it very much, and I certainly haven't, uh, I don't have a unit like this. I haven't played with it. So I, I can't comment a whole lot about it, but I have seen it being used, and it seems to be fairly popular down in the U.S. And lastly, uh, on this list anyway, there is cosmetic cupping. Now, this is all about cupping to, uh, with the intent of enhancing aesthetics. Uh, and it's out of scope of practice for MTs, but I think it's important to at least know that it's out there uh, because our patients ask about stuff like that. Um, oh, can you do this to remove wrinkles? Oh, I heard cupping was good to reduce cellulite. Well, that's not something that's directly within our scope of practice, but if we can find an aesthetician that does this kind of things, we have a great referral out. Now, um, coming up, we're going to watch a video, and that video is going to uh, demonstrate different types of cupping. So enjoy and watch the video. Dry cupping is a form of static cupping. It can be done either with silicone or vacuum cups. If you're going to do it with silicone cups, um, you would just it looks just like that. And if you're going to do it with vacuum cups, it looks like this. You do this with no lubrication uh, when you have no plans of moving it around a patient's body. Fire cupping is a form of cupping that uses fire to create the vacuum. Uh, for some massage therapists, this is going to be out of scope of practice, so check with your local laws. But this is what this looks like. So dynamic cupping is any cupping done uh, that the cup moves on the body. So uh, with a silicone cup, I've already added some lubricant on, use whatever massage oil that you like. You can just get pick up a little bit of the oil, put on a little bit of suction, and then move the cup around. Any form of moving the cups um, counts as dynamic. This is just a good example. So dynamic cupping with a vacuum cup looks fairly similar. We can just put it on with light to medium strength and then move the cup around. And that's considered dynamic cupping. 
light cupping, medium cupping, or strong cupping is usually just how much vacuum you create on a silicone cup that is not attached. Um, light cupping was just displacing the top and putting it on and you just have light suction. Uh, medium cupping is usually compressing a little bit and, uh, and having medium suction. And then strong cupping is compressing a lot and having a lot of suction. Light, medium, and strong cupping when done with a vacuum style cup is done by how many pumps you do. So for light cupping, you'd just pump it once. For medium, you'd pump it twice. And for strong cupping, three or more times. All right, I hope you saw a little bit and got some value out of that, uh, that video. Um, as you could see in the videos, some, we started to see some redness on our patient there, and that always leads me to a discussion about cupping marks. When we ask what, what's cupping, um, often the conversation almost immediately comes to the mark that's cupping. And I think it's a really interesting phenomenon because there's this semantic ar uh, argument that's going on if you uh, are involved in any sort of social media about what exactly is this mark. Some people will say, oh, it's a bruise. Some people say, well, it's not a bruise. It's a hematoma. Um, but a hematoma and bruise are synonyms. So I think it, 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 it's interesting to delve into that a little bit. So the marks are caused if the, if the cup is left for any length of time, um, you get an increase of local blood flow brought about by the suction of the cup. So if you leave it on long enough, you're actually going to start breaking capillaries. All right. And this is going to create a hematoma. All right. The hematoma by definition is a collection of clotted blood in the tissue. So here's where the semantics fit in. So a bruise, the definition of a bruise, depending on where you look, is an injury of the soft tissue that resulted in breakage of the local capillaries and leakage of red blood cells into the tissue. However, some uh, dictionaries will add it's an impact injury. And because of that addition of the word impact, uh, there are a lot of people out there that say that it's not a bruise. And some people are very, um, they have a lot of strong feelings about it. And I can understand why. There's this concept of um, do no harm in medicine. So if you're do it, creating a bruise, are you harming your patient? And I think that negativity around bruises, massage therapists shouldn't bruise our patients. Uh, and I think that negativity feeds into that a little bit. So. I'm okay with saying this mark is probably a bruise uh, because most of my patients have never heard the word hematoma before. Uh, they don't speak in the Western medical language that we use a lot of times when we talk amongst ourselves. Uh, so uh, some people will just call it, that's a cupping mark, and that's where they'll leave it. Some people will say, oh, that's a bruise. It should fade so-and-so. And there is a, a smaller population of people that talk about the bruise that will say, well, it doesn't hurt as much or it doesn't, you know, it doesn't fade in different colors to yellows and, and greens the way a normal bruise would. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that. I've seen it do all of those things. Uh, I've had myself, I've been cupped for years and years and years. So uh, my own history says that they can feel sore. They can turn colors. So I don't necessarily agree with that. And then there's this funny thing that we see um, where it, um, people take some pieces of Chinese medicine, which is where cupping usually got introduced to North America came from, um, but they make it too simplistic. And so there's this idea that in Chinese medicine, you take the cupping mark and you go, oh, it's really dark. It means the person has this or, oh, it's really light. The person has this or it's mottled more um, or speckled. So this, this is the Chinese medicine diagnosis. But then they don't cue their patient to say that this is a, only a Chinese medicine physiology not Western medicine physiology. So the patient walks out thinking all sorts of weird things about how their body works, which they didn't think before. Um, I would say to all of my colleagues who are massage therapists, 
speak in terms of Western medicine, um, a cup that is really dark colored or a cup that's really light, um, often in, especially in the forums around social media, we don't really know anything other than the picture because often that's what's posted. You have to see a picture and you say, what's the problem with this patient? But you don't know how long the cups were on, how heavy the suction was, anything about the patient's medical condition, what they were treating. So often there will be people chiming in saying, oh, this is shows this or it shows that, but we don't have enough information. You haven't assessed it properly. So I think we need to just say, in terms of Western medicine, keep our thinking and our language there so that we are talking the same language as colleagues, but we're also talking the same language to our patients. And it's the, it's the language, Western medicine is the language our patients think in. Um, they, you know, if they've gone through high school, they went through biology, or if they went through junior high, they went through biology. And the biology that we're taught is how the body works according to Western medicine, not how it works uh, according to Chinese medicine. And it's a different thing. Those physiologies aren't the same just because they translated the word for blood to blood or the word for heart to heart. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's the same thing. I don't think we can go by uh, anything in uh, evidence-based medicine without talking a little bit about the research. Uh, I think it's an important uh, piece of our puzzle and it's what keeps us a little bit lower on the professional totem pole if we're not very uh, cognizant of what's going on. So when I started thinking about doing courses in, in cupping, one of the first things I looked at was the research. And my first question is, does it have any therapeutic value? Because I think that ultimately is the most important question. Um, you know, does it work? Uh, so what I found is that it does seem to have therapeutic value. And more specifically, it works really well on patients' perceptions of pain and disability. So how they view their own pain and disability. Um, it seems to have therapeutic value in increasing range of motion for our patients. I'm going to speak a little bit more about that in, a, in the second half of the slide, but I find that really interesting. And that's what I see every day when I, when I uh, apply cupping to my patients. And specifically, there's some research on nonspecific low back pain, neck pain, and carpal tunnel. Those seem to be the best evidence right there. And then smaller evidence as we go further and further out of the different kinds of uh, things that were studied. In terms of physiology, um, what we see is an increased oxygen in local areas from an increase in local blood flow. If you've ever put a cup on or had cupping done, immediately you see, if you can see through the cup, you see redness. So that's local blood flow coming to the area of the cup. Um, and part of why they think uh, cupping, work is, cupping works is that there's this increased oxygenation in the local area. You also see uh, reductions in creatine kinase. Uh, and as soon as you see that, what you're seeing is an anti-inflammatory response from the body. And that's lovely. Uh, part of what creates pain is all of these uh, inflammatory markers and all the things that create uh, the body messaging to inflame here. Um, so if we can reduce some of these uh, markers, then we're having our patient get through their inflammatory cycle that much faster. And I said I was going to get back to range of motion because I think this is the most interesting study. So it seems to increase range of motion in injured patients, but not in healthy patients. So there was a study done, and I love, I, I love research because it's so interesting to me. So the researchers had a question, um, does cupping increase range of motion? So they took members of a soccer team and who are all inherently healthy. They actually took them out of the study if they had an injury. And what they did is they applied cupping to their hamstrings um, in a couple of different ways. And they measured before they did cupping and after they did cupping if there was any increased range of motion. 
And they found that, no, there wasn't. And I think that's kind of fascinating that you take a healthy population, apply a therapeutic intervention to them, and be surprised that they didn't get any healthier. Um, I, I think it's fascinating. But in other studies, they did measure uh, where they were taking patients with low back pain or neck pain, and when they did take them through range of motions, they did see increases. So we do see it working with uh, an injured patient, but not necessarily so much with a healthy patient. And I think that's just kind of fascinating. Um, why add cupping to your practice? And I think this is a really important question. If you have some interest, here's some answers for you of why you'd want to do this. Um, I think number one, and it's on our minds a lot, kind of in the back of our minds, is to save your hands. Uh, I remember when I was in school, there was always the rumor that, you know, massage therapist would only last about seven years. That was our lifespan as a massage therapist. Uh, thankfully, at 23 years, for me, that's uh, been shown to be a lie. So I certainly there are other people who come into the field and get out of the field right away, whether that's to injury or not. Who knows? I don't know who's done the studies around that. But uh, we have this kind of this rumor going around. And I think that it's important that we at least say to ourselves, OK, what can we do to save our hands? What can we do to not get repetitive strain injuries or things like that? I think cupping is a really useful tool for us to save our our hands. Um, I like to think of the myofascial treatments where you get on to the tissue with your hands, you engage the tissue, and then you hold it. And I don't know about any of you guys, but if I'm holding it for particularly long, I start to shake a little bit. And I think that's interesting because when I started applying cups in a myofascial manner, um, I'd put the cups on and then just step back from the treatment a little bit. And the cups are on until I take them off. They don't ever tire out. They can hold that fascial stretch or whatever, that engagement with the tissue for as long as you leave them on there. Um, there's certainly there's some safety precautions. You don't want to have our patients blister or bruise too badly or anything like that. So there is some time limits in it. But certainly the engagement of tissue with cups is uh, much, I can, I can hold it much longer than I can with my hands. Uh, one of the, uh, for those of you who practice any form of trigger point therapy, and yes, we can have a whole class devoted to the conversation around trigger point therapy, but for those of you who practice that kind of, that in that fashion, we're using thumbs or ischemic compression, and sorry if you can hear the sirens going along. We're close to a hospital here at my office. Um, but for those of you who uh, do trigger point therapy, one of the things that the students, when I teach this class, one of the things the students notice, and therefore I think it's kind of profound because some of, most of my uh, people that I've been teaching lately have been very new to therapy, so they haven't really gotten a good feeling of like that really sensitive hands. You know, they're still trying to figure out what normal is. Uh, but, you know, the ones that can identify a trigger point and work on it, uh, I watch them when they're applying cupping and a lot of times we'll see them, you know, working on each other in between cups or stuff like that. And I'm just like, I say, why don't you just put a cup on that and see what happens? And they put a cup on and three or five minutes later, they take the cup off and then they go back and they feel it with their hands and the tissues change so quickly. So, and they didn't have to exhaust their hands at all by doing that. So I, I think it's really uh, quite amazing what you can find. Now, when you have cups on, you can do other things. But if you look at repetitive strain injury um, classes or things, uh, uh, the science behind repetitive strain, and they always talk about taking micro breaks throughout your work. So where as massage therapists, we push and push and push and push on our patients all the time. It's quite nice to apply the cups and then just step back for one or two seconds or not have your hands on someone and having to 
reach over, grab a cup from the bin that you have all your clean cups in, or when you take the cups off, put them in the other bin where the dirty cups go. Uh, it's nice to have that little bit of a break where you're not pushing on that patient always consistently throughout the time. Um, so what we find, just cupping can have the desired effect that you want on the tissue with a whole lot of less time spent and a whole lot of less effort. I think that's really important for us. Also, I really love the reaction of patients when they get cupping done. They almost always respond favorably. Um, and I say almost, on, almost always because some patients don't like the feeling of a, a very strong cupping treatment. It's a lot of suction and it feels really tight. So with them, if, with, as with any patient, you have to just pay attention to what they're telling you and you ease back the pressure of the vacuum. Um, we find that cupping, I, I can have a patient test them for a range of motion, identify the restriction, put the cups on, have them move in the direction that I want them to move, take the cups off, 30 seconds has elapsed, get them to retest the range of motion, and often it has equalized. Um, it's such a fast neurological effect. Uh, it's so fascinating. And the look on their face says it all. Like, I couldn't do that 30 seconds ago. This cupping is amazing. Uh, and, and patients have seen the marks in the media. They've seen it, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow, J-Lo, all these people who've been on People magazine or they've seen it with the Olympics, all these athletes with these cup marks on it, especially in this last one. Um, so they think, well, if the Olympic athletes are doing it, they should too. They should add it in as part of it. Uh, so it's quite fascinating um, how they see it and perceive it. And certainly I laughed. I was down in Florida on a vacation last year and I'd had some cupping done. I slept poorly on a bad, bad, uh, bad mattress. So I threw a bunch of cups on my lower back and just went about uh, doing a few things and I bruised fairly easily. I mark really easily. So I took the cups off and I had really good marks up the back of my uh, lower lumbar. And, you know, a day or two later, I was uh, gone, gone to the beach and three people stopped and asked me about cupping while I was on the beach. So it's a different way to uh, differentiate your, uh, your practice in your community if, if people see these people with marks, your patients or yourself. And they're definitely conversation starters. They want to know how it feels. They want to know everything about it. So uh, it's a beautiful way to introduce people to your practice. And it can increase your revenue. I just heard everybody's ears perk up. Um, for some people, they'll use it as an add-on for the price of their treatment. Uh, that's not that common in strictly massage clinics, but in multidisciplinary clinics where there's a physiotherapist who does, you know, $5 extra for taping and $5 extra for uh, acupuncture or whatever, or same thing with the chiropractor or same thing with um, other charges, naturopaths or stuff like that. You'll see it as a, a as an add-on. Um, but for me, um, what I like it for is it increases the value of my treatments for my patients. So they get more out of their treatment. I can spend, um, I can focus more time on more areas um, and they get better results quicker. So they think the value is better. And you, <laughs> you cup one person who goes to a gym, often you'll start getting people from the gym because the patients will, en uh, other people will engage your patients and talk with them about it. And the referrals do increase and they increase quite a bit. <clears throat> so who can get cupping? So I think this is a really uh, a big topic. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break it down into contraindications, then indications. And I think we're starting with contraindications is important because 
uh, not everything is always sunny and roses. We don't apply every tool that we do to every patient that we have. Um, we, we need as massage therapists to be discerning over who gets what kind of treatment because in a lot of cases it is our decision. So contraindications, uh, the, I always say just say no when you're cupping over veins, arteries, or nerves, or varicose veins. Um, just don't cup over skin lesions or any inflammation. And don't cup over orifices or eyes. I don't know why we had to write that down, but <laughs> I would guess that somebody did it. Um, so these kind of things are important. And I put this little picture of the tattoo because the question is often asked, uh, can I do cupping over a tattoo? And with everything, I says it depends. It depends on how you assessed it. So if the tattoo is fairly new and it's healing or within the first few months where the skin hasn't closed up, there might be some bleeding or scabbing, depending on how new it is, um, I generally don't. Uh, you don't want to start the um, any wounds bleeding. So if it's scabbing, well, that's a skin lesion. Don't apply cupping over it. But if it's been there for years, oh, sure, go ahead, cup over it. I've never had, in my experience, I've never had any problems with that. Um, absolute contraindications. Uh, so in terms of different kinds of things people would come in with, um, we don't do any cupping with patients with cancer. Now, 23 years ago when I started practicing massage, we also used to say we don't do massage therapy with patients who have cancer. Thankfully, that's changed because people started doing research and showed how good massage therapy is for patients with cancer. Now, I wouldn't say that you should just therefore go ahead and apply cupping. In fact, I would say don't apply cupping to cancer patients, mostly because we don't really know all of the effects that cupping has on the body. And really, I have yet to see a... Um, research article about cupping on patients with cancer. Uh, so if part of our driving force is to do no harm, then we shouldn't be experimenting on patients. So that goes again with organ failures, so renal, hepatic, or cardiac failure. Uh, these patients are very, very sick. Uh, their fluid levels are having a problem. So with creating a bruise on a patient, you're actually taking fluid out of the circulatory system. So we don't want to necessarily do that because it might be very bad for the patient uh, in the long term. So if our patients are in organ failure or being treated for organ failure, we just don't treat them with cupping. Again, patients with pacemakers are in this category because they are somewhere in the cardiac failure uh, range, even though they are fairly controlled with that pacemaker. It's just, I, again, I haven't seen any research around this, so do no harm. Let's not, let's not uh, experiment on our patients. And then there's patients with hemophilia or any sort of bleeding disorder. Um, obviously, if part of our treatment can have the possibility of bruising a patient or breaking of blood vessels where they'll bleed into their own tissue. A person who doesn't clot very well, like a person who has hemophilia, uh, is going to have a big problem with that. So you're going to take a lot of blood out of their circulatory system. Um, so I would say just don't do any uh, cupping with that kind of patient. Now, the relative ones is where we kind of get interesting um, because this all always comes down to our best judgment. So um, there is some wiggle room in these. So patients with acute infections, uh, patients who are using anticoagulants like aspirin or warfarin, uh, patients with severe chronic diseases, patients that are pregnant uh, during their purpurium uh, or are menstruating, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. I'll come back to it. Uh, patients who are anemic, 
uh, patients who have recently given blood and undergone medical procedures, and patients who do not consent. So, um, patients who are pregnant during the purpurium or menstruating are anemic or have given blood uh, recently or undergone medical procedure recently, I group them all in the same group. And why I group them like that is that they are all patients that are possibly anemic. So if you bruise them, if you take blood out of their circulatory system, they have the potential for fainting and dizziness and all sorts of things that are negative outcomes. So we don't want that for our patients. So we have to ask questions and uh, talk to them and make sure that we're fully assessing them to make sure that cupping is safe to apply. Um, patients who do not consent, I put them in this uh, relative contraindications because patients can withdraw consent. So if they've consented to a treatment, but then in while you're doing it, withdraw their consent, you have to stop doing their treatment uh, with cupping anyway, um, if that's what they're withdrawing consent for. Uh, so I'll talk about consent later on in the slide or in this in this uh, presentation, but I think it's important just to mention that. And with acute infections, uh, part of that is you don't want the infection. Uh, part of it is um, community health. Uh, I don't want people taking the bus, who are sick, taking the bus, coming to see me, you know, infecting all the patients in the waiting room, infecting all of me, and so on and so on. I'd rather them stay at home. Uh, but however, if they have an acute infection, like um, they have a hangnail on their toe or a toe fungus, I'm not going to be contraindicated from doing cupping on their shoulder or things like that. And anticoagulants, if a patient is only taking an aspirin, um, every day and that's a daily thing that they've taken just because their doctor told them to but they don't bruise really easily or anything like that then they probably are going to be safe for doing cupping but if they're taking warfarin or bruise really poorly or, or bruise quite quite a, uh, a lot then you don't want to be applying cupping because of that bruise so then who can you apply cupping to so uh, indications of cuffing are uh, pain conditions, muscular tightness, arthritis, and you'll see the research tends to point towards more rheumatoid, but there is some good research that says osteoarthritis as well. Uh, all the entrapment syndromes, carpal tunnel syndrome, thoracic outlet syndrome, decoirvins, and things like that. Um, conditions where you would do massage where the physiology of the cuffing may be beneficial. These are your indications. This is why you would use it. So as long as they're not a contraindication and they have one of these indications and you have consent, you're good to go. And so with cupping, as it can be applied to nearly all patients um, that you can see and that you would normally see, it must be done so with consent. And the one thing I think is interesting about consent is we don't get taught, talked to, uh, or taught a lot about how we go about getting consent. And one of those things has to be that the patient must know the risks involved as well as the rewards. So just going in and say, yeah, cupping will work. It'll help you increase your range of motion. You'll have a decrease in pain from this treatment. That's not good enough. The risk is, oh, you're gonna have these rewards, but the risks are you can feel a little bit dizzy. You can be nauseated. You might have some bruises. Um, these kind of things uh, should be explained to our patients. Uh, we usually, I have my therapist script this. So when you take a much longer class for me, um, you would script uh, your consent. And that way you say the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, and it becomes really easy uh, to discuss with your patients. Now, we're going to get into the how to do cupping. And so I'm going to do that with a set of videos. So take a look at these videos and uh, I'll be right back. How to cup with silicone cups. So how silicone cups work are that they're springy. 
So what we do is decrease the volume somehow inside the cup and then allow the springiness of the silicone to create the vacuum on the inside. So first of all, we have to either crush the cup to put it on with a seal and let it go, or we put the cup down, breaking the seal with a finger, and then compress the cup to decrease its volume, let the seal go, and then let the cup go. To take a silicone cup off, all you want to do is compress it down a little bit to make it easier to see, break the seal with a finger, and then it'll pop right off. Cupping with a vacuum set is easy. You just put the gun or, how, or the hose onto the end of the, the cup, put the cup on so that it seals, and you're using air pressure to suck out through the gun, and then you take the gun off. To remove a vacuum style pump, usually you just displace the vacuum seal. For this one, you just need to turn it on its side and it pops off. These cups are a silicone cup. They're very flexible. They're called a negative ion cup. And to get these ones to create a vacuum, what you do is you turn them inside out, put them on the patient where you want them, and then press down four corners and it just springs back and creates a seal, pulling the skin with it. To take off a negative ion cup, all you're doing is breaking the seal, so place your finger underneath it and it pops off. All right, so that gives you a little idea of how to do some cupping with some of the different cups. And of course, once you've done cupping, they have some oil on them, or they've at least been on a person, so you have to clean them. Um, there's a lot of things around cleaning, again, in social media and cupping forums online that uh, I'd like to uh, talk about, uh, but let's leave it to what we definitely know. So cleaning has to be done with soap and water. Uh, the goal is to remove all the visible material of the cup, and it's done regardless of the level of disinfection. So immediately after you've used the cup, you have to clean it. And once you've cleaned it, you shake off the excess water and then you move on towards disinfecting. So disinfecting and what we do should be considered high level disinfection. Um, so the cups are, you already clean them. And then you can have this whole list of things like glutaraldehyde, hydrogen peroxide, parasitic acid, and on and on that can be good for high level disinfection. Of these, uh, my recommendation is always the 7.5% hydrogen peroxide because it's cheap, it's environmentally friendly. Um, all you have to do is in this solution, uh, let the cup soak for 30 minutes and you've achieved a high level disinfection. Um, if their patient happens to bleed in a cup, because sometimes you'll pop an acne pimple or something to that effect, uh, and the patient bleeds a little in the cup, at that point, you have to sterilize it. So if you leave it in the solution for six hours, it's considered sterile. So it works really well for that. Um, and when you're done with the hydrogen peroxide, when it's uh, outdone its lifespan, um, because there is a shelf life to it, or a number of uses anyway, um, you can pour it down the sink and it's perfectly acceptable to put into uh, both septic fields and uh, your city's water system. Uh, I'd like to also talk a little bit about safety in the practice. Um, always make sure your liability insurance covers you for doing cupping. Um, you also want to think about how many cups you have in stock versus uh, can you clean them appropriately in between patients and disinfect them. Uh, do you have the supplies on hand in your treatment room or are you running out to grab more cups from an, another treatment room? Um, and that just is more about how you look in terms of your professionality uh, to your patient. And also there's safety in, ad in advertising and communication. And I think this is important um, with the, in the age of social media that we really have to pay attention to what we're saying cupping can do uh, and not bringing in other ideas from Chinese medicine or other ideas of where, uh, how cupping works in other physiologies, uh, alternate physiologies, if you like. Um, the 
idea of communicating in Western medicine to our Western patients, because really we want to communicate to patients that will come into our doors. So uh, safety in advertising is quite important. Um, and then people ask me, well, how do I apply it in my treatment? And I say, it generally doesn't alter your massage therapy treatment plan. It's just a tool. Um, you can just add it in as long as it's available in your treatment room. Um, one of my favorite ways to add it in is uh, if a patient comes in, I can f squeeze them in at the end of my day uh, and apply mostly cupping as the soft tissue mobility, still take them through the massage therapy assessment. I look at them uh, making critical choices uh, and using my professional judgment to understand what their problem is. But instead of doing an eighth or ninth treatment in a day and possibly hurting my hands, I'm going to apply cupping and have them move through ranges of motion uh, so that they can get the most benefit from the treatment as fast as I can apply it. So in that case, the cups are generally on from three to five minutes or three to 10 minutes, uh, very quick treatment. So it allows me 15 to 20 minute treatments. It's a wonderful way to add it in. The next uh, little bit is going to be some videos um, about cupping with massage and then cupping with some remedial exercise. So enjoy those. So dynamic cupping is, a, as I said before, a style of massage with cupping. So with a silicone cup, we can do things um, in different directions. You can use back and forth um, types of strokes. You can use frictions which feel really nice. Anything that's dynamic, anything that's moving, you need a little bit of lubrication, but anything that's moving is considered dynamic cupping. One of my favorites is getting a good strong hold, pulling up a little bit, and then gliding along the tissue. A form of dynamic cupping is going to be using the cup as an instrument, so you can use it um, and it's better to do it with the rigid styles with a fairly light um, amount of uh, suction, taking it and moving it along, but then using the edge of the cup at the same time to do a little bit of the massage. Um, it saves your hands quite a bit this way. And you can actually take the, take the suction right out of it and use it directly if you want to use it on a trigger point or over top of an area that's just a little bit hard to get and just work through with the edge of the cup. Flash cupping is a style of cupping where you put on and take off the cups very quickly uh, and it's meant just to draw some blood to the surface and engage his neurological system. So how we do it with a silicone cup is by squeezing it. So it's that kind of um, way to create it. So we put it on and we pop it off and you just move a little bit each time to cover the area that you want. You're not trying to get a lot of pressure each time. You're just trying to bring some blood to the surface. This one, when done properly, won't mark a patient. This is fast cupping, which is a style of flash cupping. So again, we're trying not to mark our patient. Uh, what we're going to be doing is trying to pull fluid along an area. So this is great for lymphatic drainage, but it's also neurologically very good for patients who are, have a neuropathy or tingling or anything like that. So how we do it is we would put a cup on as usual, medium to light, put another one on in the line that we wanna go, put another one, and then we can take them off and we just leapfrog them over each other. So this one can go to the bottom again. So you can do this with two hands or you can do it with one hand or the squeezing method works really well. And 
you just keep going up that same path. So we've done this a few times already with Dan. So you can see that we're getting red right along the path of the cups. One of my favorite um, ways to incorporate cupping in remedial exercise is to do active ranges of motion. So for our patient here, we're going to have him doing cat and cow in a minute, but I'm just gonna put on some cuffs and this resists the direction that he's going to go in. It's creating, it's, it's pulling the muscle a little bit tight. So then we would instruct him to go through cat and cow. So he's gonna go through that and then the opposite direction and lift your head up. Right, and up again. So if you're a yoga instructor, this is great. And But if you are uh, doing remedial exercise, what I usually have the person do is have a seat and relax. So in seated, it is the same exercise where I have a patient go into flexion and let their back come way back out and then into extension and lift their head up. And this is essentially the same exercise. Go back into flexion and then come into extension and then relax. And then we can take the cups off. One of my favorite remedial exercises for uh, the back portion of the shoulder is done with the vacuum cups. And we put these on knowing that some of them are gonna pop off when he's going to do this um, motion. But we get them sorted out with the cups on and for massage therapists or people that work with their shoulders a lot you can see he's starting to turn red really quickly and that's pretty normal so the exercise is then do a convict so bring your arms up beside you and then yep and then lift up towards the ceiling and do up and down about three or four times this one comes off pretty normal for them to come off where the skin will crinkle don't worry about them too much you're looking for more global effects good and one more and then arms back down to normal and then we take the cups off and then have your patient go through that range of motion again, just to see how it feels. Try and reinforce the feeling. Good, and relax. So you saw in those videos that we apply uh, cupping uh, in areas globally or specifically, depending on how you want to treat them. But I always come back to how have you assessed your patient and what are you treating? Know those things. It's not just I put on this big blanket of cups over all this whole area that that patient is sore, have them move or move the cups, uh, and that is good enough for the treatment. What I want to do is, okay, is it, you know, a tricep on their right arm that is hypertonic, and then apply cupping appropriately to that to get the biggest bang for my buck. Again, if you can, the more specific your assessment can be, the more targeted your treatment can be, and therefore shorter, so you can fit more patients in every day. Remember that cupping is a modality. Um, it's a tool that you can use uh, and doesn't take the place of a good assessment. Uh, it just adds to a tool that you can use once you have assessed. Uh, where to cup in the body. And I just love this picture. This is, these are taken from a lot of our classes. And basically, you can cup anywhere on the body that you can get at. Um, I always think of it, you've got to think about cupping and draping together. So if you're adding it into your regular massage treatment and your patient is draped, you have to always make sure that your, your cupping techniques are closely tied 
with how your patient is comfortable and feeling safe. Uh, it is their feeling of safety, of, of comfort and safe, uh, safety that is uh, really important in this place. And it makes them feel more confident in your treatment. So cop only in areas where you can uh, drape appropriately. Um, with a lot of my patients who are coming in, in in those short treatments kind of packed into the end of the day, what I do with them is tell them to bring shorts like they're going to go work out, uh, shorts and a, and a tank top. And I find that works really well. Um, then there's less time for them getting changed. I don't have to really worry about the bulkiness of, uh, of uh, extra drapes. Uh, it works quite nice. So know what you're doing and have a plan. So last words, and I always come back to these, uh, is that consent is about the positives and the negatives. Just make sure your patients are agreeing to the treatments that you're giving them. Um, always script that interaction. And then use your cups as you would any other mod modality. Um, it has to fit the treatment and the treatment plan and the treatment principles that you're using. So important to make sure that uh, what you're applying, you can defend it uh, as an action. If one of your uh, patients sees another colleague in a room uh, in your clinic and they say, oh yeah, you know, Paul did cupping on me and my other therapist should be able to look at that chart and say, oh, I know why he used cupping because it's right here in the charting notes. So. Make sure that it fits in really well. All right. And a little bit about us. Thank you so much. Um, Melanie, that's all I've got for you. So if you can, uh, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Great. Well, thank you so much, Paul. I really appreciated the, um, the visuals, uh, especially, wow, that one at the beginning there where you had the horn, the horn cupping. That <laughs> So Absolutely incredible. And I didn't know that uh, cupping had such a long history, but, you know, like so many of these practices, it just makes sense that it has been around for a long time. So that was kind of a cool uh, start to the to the um, to the program uh, to talk about that and to see that. Yeah, I think it's fascinating because it, it and this is only as old as we know about it. Someone had to write it down and that was 1500 B.C., <laughs> very good point. Very good point. How, how long was it practiced before then? We right, don't know. Right. Yeah. Um, now you talk. What I like to is that you talked about various types of cupping because clearly it's it's a lot like massage where someone can come in and say, "Oh, I'd like a massage, please." And have you had massage before? Oh, yeah, I've had plenty of massage before. Well, they could have had fourteen <laughs> different, a hundred different styles of massage. So knowing sure. the various types of cupping, you can see how important that is for us as. Um, therapist because if a client comes in or just wants to book cupping it's really important for us to be able to understand what their experience is and what their definition of it is and what we do in our own practice so thank you for sharing all of those different styles as well and reminding us of the importance of knowing what those are yeah it's super important to be exposed to all manner of cupping and you know in our classes we we teach um, with a little bit with the glass cups and ceramic cups, but mostly with vacuum cups, the plastic kind with the little seal or with silicone cups uh, and a couple of variations of those uh, because we think it's important that our therapists who are trained has an, an exposure to as many different kinds as we can have because it benefits the patients. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And like you said, like the, we have the opportunity as well to start um, learning about what other people are doing with cupping. And then we can refer like to the esthetician, like you had mentioned. So I might come in and say, hey, I, I'd like a cupping session. But, oh, I didn't realize you didn't do the cupping on my face as well for, you know, other other things that I was expecting. So, again, yeah. it's that uh, real great. You have to have super great communication with this and be able to explain to people exactly what you can do and then have those opportunities to refer out. Oh, absolutely. I refer out to Chinese medicine practitioners 
um, when I'm unavailable. Um, I refer it to Chinese medicine practitioners for some kinds of cupping if I'm doing it from that licensed state. <laughs> um, and mm -hmm. if, I, if they're my massage patients and they've been getting cupping with the very strong Western medicine assessment skills and all of that, uh, I refer them to massage therapists who do cupping. So it's really kind of important to know what your, what your limitations are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, this became so popular uh, with the 2016 Olympics. Um, yeah. When people started seeing that, I was working at a wellness center at the time, and our phones just blew up with people wanting cupping. Um, so you can also see the importance of because there uh, could be some bruising hematoma, as you talked about, the real vital importance of that um, of that initial discussion on intake and that informed consent as we go, and just the reminders of the client uh, that something may show up. Oh yeah, my favorite my my, my favorite story about that. I had a patient, um, uh, he, uh, his kids know me as well, so they all, uh, they all know me. So he comes in and he's got a problem. I put cups on him. Again, it was fit in at the end of the day, so assess him and I'm only going to cup him because I'm tired. And uh, it's the best tool to do that treatment that day. So I treat him and then I just blanket cupped him. So it was a whole shoulder problem. He's, he'd been having um, some issues, and pretty much the whole shoulder was chronic at this point. So there was, you know, anterior deltoid, posterior deltoid, infraspinatus, all down his bicep and tricep. So all these cupping marks, and we're talking as these cups are on because I'm not moving them around. I'm not having him move. And then, you know, 10 minutes later, I take them all off, and he's uh, he's uh, got some marks. And I know, oh, you're going to probably bruise, but, you know, so expect it. And he goes home, and the next day, I get a phone call at the office from his five-year-old. Paul, we want to come to your office to see your octopus. <laughs> and I, I said, what? So her dad, who was the patient that I treated, um, had told them that my pet octopus had treated him that day. So very oh funny. That's I know, so it's a brilliant sweet. story. I so love it. It, it's, it, it, it's a way to engage uh, kids so that they aren't freaked out by, um, mm -hmm. by the marks. Yeah. Um, now, I know like one of the great things about this cupping is that you can start with um, some basic information and some basic um, uh, pieces of the uh, equipment, right? Like that's what's Absolutely. really nice. Is it seems like you can integrate it into your practice. I know that you guys um, have some courses that you teach, uh, including some introductory courses, which is fabulous. Absolutely. So if people are interested in learning like just a little bit about, wow, what might this look like? How would I integrate it into my practice? I really encourage you to start taking a look at this as um, as an easy add-on um, to your practice. And then you can, it looks like you've got some really great in-depth classes as well. So can you tell yeah. us a little bit more? Uh, and I think you have another slide for us that, um, I that do. where we I can get some more information. I just popped it up while you were talking. Perfect. Perfect. So yeah, yeah so, tell us where we can get some more information and about a little bit about the classes that you guys teach. So the classes, and let me just make sure I didn't skip one. No, I didn't. So here's our contact information. So we have a Facebook group and all of that. And for, at our website, this last slide, uh, we're giving people 10% off either uh, both their first order um, or um, in courses as well. No, this one is, uh, sorry, this one is just the first order. Um, if you use this d discount code, which is <clears throat> WMC for, of course, the World Massage Conference. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you go to our website, Canada Cupping or, or, or sorry, Cupping Canada or Cupping USA, um, if you're down in the States, you can use the US one. Um, you'll see in there is a big list of courses because we're teaching all the time and the, the courses are really quite easy, um, uh, in that we want you to come out of it at the end, able to apply it tomorrow. So you take the introductory course, you're going to be able to use it the next day. Then if you take 
So it generally works. We have an introductory, an upper body, a lower body, and then more advanced course. And then we've got some self-care courses. And we're also developing some other courses in it because the rabbit hole goes down deep when you mm -hmm. think of what can you do to uh, with cops. And people want to know these things like treating scar tissue and things like that. So um, the first set of courses is more of an introduction, gets you the, some science behind you and being able to apply it to a patient uh, first part of the day upper and lower body are really important because uh, it gives you some more hands-on experience, uh, gets you a little bit more confident and starts introducing you to some of the different concepts that we use in how we apply cupping as a tool within a massage therapy setting. And then the advanced one is more for those therapists that want to go a little bit further. They do already do some remedial exercise or they want to do some remedial exercise and the way you can add cups on it to increase the neurological effects of your treatment. Um, so that's the courses uh, in a nutshell. And then self-care, I think, is kind of evident how you would do it on yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, but part of that is actually how you would teach it to your patients. So then you could add on selling them a set of cups and um, having them take it home and do their self-care uh, with cups at home. Oh, that's great. I didn't realize there was that um, that opportunity for retail product oh, as well. That's fabulous. That's all the little add-ons that add up. It is. It is. I know, and right? People love that. People love well, that. Do. And I love taking, I mean, I've spent a lot, I've invested a lot in self-care um, tools. So that's fantastic. Great. Um, anything else before we go? I think that's it for me. I'd just like to thank you for the opportunity to present. This is so much fun. Fantastic. It was a great class, a uh, really great opportunity to learn more about cupping and how to integrate that into our practices. So just before we go, uh, again, I'd like to thank Paul so much for your time and effort and energy on the, um, on the class today. Really, really appreciate that. My pleasure. And, thank you. And thank you to our global sponsor, Massage Envy. As a massage therapist, you put your heart and soul into helping others feel their best. You deserve a career that nurtures you as a person, an artist, and a professional. Visit massageenvy.com forward slash careers to find a career that cares for you. Massage Envy, Envy franchise locations are independently owned and operated and are sole employers for all positions they hire. Thank you so much to our wonderful education partners. The Associated Bodywork and Massage Professionals provides an extensive array of member benefits and exceptional liability insurance. Visit abmp.com to discover why over 80,000 massage and bodywork professionals have chosen ABMP as their professional association. Thank you so much to our daily sponsors, Massage and Bodywork Magazine, Bon Vitel, BioFreeze, and Massage Warehouse.